We're in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. If you have a Bible there, Matthew, chapter 6. You'll find us there. We've been going through the book of Matthew, and specifically right now we're in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew, chapter 5 through 7, Jesus' longest recorded sermon that we have in the Gospels. And, uh, and, and this week, the subject of this passage that Jesus is going to speak on is worry. Worry. Some of y'all are worried about what I'm going to say about worry. Because you're a worrier. And if you're not worried, you might be worried about not being worried right now. But it goes really closely with last week's passage uh, where Jesus told us not to store up treasures on earth where moth and rust can destroy, where thieves can break in and steal, but instead store up treasures in heaven. And it's interesting, you know, it's kind of a, one of those money passages here in the Bible. I don't skip them, but I don't really love talking about money. I don't do it very often. And if you don't believe me, um, you, you know that I'm not real fired up about, you know, asking people for money. I forgot to remind you about the offering baskets last Sunday after I preached on storing up treasures in heaven. Isn't that funny? That's a big preacher mistake. But the, these principles go so well together, and Jesus is actually going to answer some questions that that previous passage brings up. Like, like for example, you know, if, if Jesus tells you to store up your treasures in heaven, don't store them up here on earth, don't hoard your things here on earth, be generous, well, how will you then be provided for? And the answer comes here in this passage. And, you know, it says that, you know, a person can't serve two masters. They'll either love the one and hate the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. That's in verse 24. You can't serve both God and money. You can't have two masters. Remember, you can have two bosses, but you can't have two masters. And then the question then is, well, if, if God is my master, is he a good master? Can I count on him to take care of me? The point then, I think, is be generous in the first section. The second section is because God is generous. Let's read that passage this morning. My Bible labels it, interestingly enough, the cure for anxiety. Therefore, verse 25, therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe the wildflower of the field and how they grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble, trouble of its own. And so there's, there's three things that he tells you specifically not to worry about. And, and it's just interesting to think about those three things. They're food, drink, and clothes. These are basic necessities of survival. Isn't that interesting? He tells these people who, who live day to day, who didn't have the wardrobe or the pantry that you have, I promise. He says, don't worry about those things they desperately need. Isn't it true that most of the time we in Cushing, Oklahoma, worry about a lot more frivolous things than these basic needs for our survival? We worry about things that are much less important than food or clothes. I mean, if you don't have clothes... You're going to freeze to death and be embarrassed. You don't have something to drink. You know, 
Survivalists talk about the rule of threes. You know, you can survive three minutes without air, three days without water, and three weeks without food, three hours in a harsh environment if you don't have adequate protection on your body. These are basic needs of survival, and yet we're worried about other things that really don't matter anywhere near as much as those things matter. I heard about a man named Dave who went to uh, a psychiatrist after years and years of worry and anxiety had wrecked his life, and he finally went and saw this professional. The professional told him to go out and hire a professional worrier, and he did. One of his friends noticed the difference it made in his life and said, Dave, I can tell that's really helped. What's, what's going to see that psychiatrist? What has it done for you? He said, well, I, I went out and hired a professional worrier. Now I don't have to worry anymore. His friend said, man, that sounds great, but, but how much does that cost? And Dave said it costs $5,000 a month. His friend said, oh, my goodness, how can you afford that? And uh, Dave said, I don't know, but that's his problem. <laughs> Isn't it true we often worry about things that never happen? Maybe, maybe most of the time we worry about things that don't even come to pass. They're just imaginary scenarios we concoct in our mind. And sometimes we foolishly even attribute the fact that they didn't happen to the fact that we worried about them as if our worry could change the future. Most of the time it doesn't even take place. Sometimes worry evolves. And, and here's three kinds of worry that I'll tell you about this morning. One of them is actually good. So some of you worriers are excited. I'm about to tell you something good about your worry. But it's really not. It's actually concern. I would tell you concern is good. Like you should be concerned about some things in your life, right? There's some things that you should give a certain amount of concern to. Some of you were concerned about being on time to church today, and I'm glad you're here. There's some things you ought to take care of your children. You ought to be concerned about that. But sometimes we let good concern, godly concern turn into worry. And I think that's what's being addressed here is that kind of worry. You know, it's it's okay to be concerned about what you're going to eat, but it's not okay to worry about it. And then worry can evolve into anxiety. Anxiety and worry, not good. But I wanted to take a quick second to say that some people deal with maybe chronic, severe, prolonged, ongoing, crippling, debilitating anxiety. And they might have what we would call an anxiety disorder. And if that's you today or if you have gone through that or go through that, uh, I don't want to get up here and beat you up too hard. You know, we have a lot of resources available in the world we live in today, professionals that you can talk to, get help with that kind of thing. And so I want to encourage you to do that if, if that's something that you deal with. But the issue here then is worry. Worry. That's, that's what that, uh, the topic would be today. And, and I want to start out coming, coming, coming right at you. Uh, I, I, I want to get the hard stuff over with, and then I'll be just easy after that. Okay? You believe that? Maybe it's your first time. Maybe you believe that. I don't know. So, so if you're like me, and you probably are, because um, you seem pretty awesome, I, I often worry more about uh, other people's issues than my own. Here's what I'm talking about. Uh, I don't say that boastfully. What I'm saying is a lot of times I trust God with, with something that only affects me. But when it affects my loved ones, I worry a little bit more. And sometimes we spiritualize that, don't we? We kind of church it up. We say, well, the Bible says we're supposed to love people. It's good to be concerned about people. And you're right, it is, but it's, listen, it's not good to be worried about people. Because we have to trust God, not just with ourselves, we have to trust other people to God as well. We have to trust God with our loved ones. And that's often more difficult than just trusting him with ourselves. And, and you say, well, well um, th- this passage really is about people whose master is God. By believers, followers of Jesus, God's people. And that person that I'm worried about is not a follower of Jesus. So God's not 
God's not going to take care of them according to this passage. He's just going to take care of his people. But let me ask you this. You know, if, if you matter to God and they matter to you, don't you think they matter to God? I think so. So we need to entrust not only ourselves, but our loved ones to God as well, not worry about them. And let me take that, that same idea of entrusting others and flip it over just a little bit. You know, your loved ones you should entrust to God, but here's another, another one you should entrust to God. Your enemies you should entrust to God as well. You say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian pastor. I don't have enemies. Okay, well, you can call them whatever you want to call them, okay? But those people that you don't get along with, that you're not right with, that y'all, don't, y'all butt heads at work or at the whatever activity you go to, the person you have that ongoing thing with, the person that you're worried about, but not because you care about them. You're worried that something good might happen to them, and you don't want it to. You know what? Give, give the people you love to God, but let me just say this. Give the people you don't love to God, too. Wouldn't that be good? And trust them to God as well. And, and so <clears throat> back to the text here. It says uh, really three things, I think, are pointed out here. Three things are pointed out in the text that uh, God gives us as reasons not to worry. Three things here. The first one is, he says, think about the birds. Think about the birds out there and the grass and the lilies of the field, or the flowers, wildflowers out there in the field. You know, as Jesus was speaking this by the uh, Sea of Galilee, he'd be up on one of those mountains, Sermon on the Mount, you know, overlooking the sea. And in that area where he was probably sitting, there was probably birds flying around. And there was probably these wildflowers growing and the grass of the field was waving in the breeze. And so as Jesus said these things, he probably was, think think about those those birds over there. Think about these flowers over here on this side. And the point is that birds don't cultivate. They don't plant crops. They don't harvest crops. They don't store crops in their barns. And yet... Somehow, God is able to take care of them. Here's something you may not know about birds. Birds don't have savings accounts. And they don't have investment portfolios. They don't have 401ks. They don't have insurance. And yet, birds still exist. And they do just fine. And matter of fact, it says that birds don't worry. They just depend on God's creation to take care of them. Now now listen. If you hear me say, don't worry today, don't worry, don't worry. By the way, it's, that word worry is used six times in nine verses here. And you're a lazy person. You might use what Jesus says to justify your laziness. But think about the birds for a moment. The birds work really hard. The birds work hard, but they don't worry. So it's not an excuse to be lazy. I had a a girl that came up to me one time, and I don't think it was this passage, but another one similar to this, trusting God, not worrying about your life. And uh, she was mad at me because she had a lazy boyfriend. She said, don't tell him that. He's already carefree enough, you know. And I was like, well, you need to break up with him. He's a bum. You know, that's why, that was my advice to her. But it's not that we shouldn't work. It's not that we shouldn't work hard. And so we work hard and we depend on God. And you shouldn't for a moment think that it's because of all your hard work and your effort that you are alive today. You are still dependent on God just like the birds are. In the grass, God takes care of them. He says, aren't you worth more than them? Look at the little sparrows flying around. There's just a million of them. They're all over the place. Sometimes a a, a big enough field, you can fly through one on a four-wheeler with a tennis racket and, you know, take out a bunch. They're just everywhere. He says, you're worth more than they are. Don't you think? Don't you think God values you more than birds? Of course. Let, Let me ask you this. Did Jesus die for birds? No. Are birds made in the image of God? No, your life is worth so much more than the life of a bird. Animal life, plant life, it's nowhere close to human life. We value human life above everything because human life is made in God's image. Jesus died for human life. Can I make an off-topic application for you this morning? From this passage, from that idea, that principle, an off-topic 
application of this passage. You know, since 1918 in America, it's been illegal to kill migratory birds. Since, since 1918, over 100 years, we've been protecting the birds. And, and you know what that includes? Not just the birds. It also includes their nests and their eggs inside of there. And, and the penalty for killing a bird or, or a, a migratory or endangered bird, for killing them or for destroying their eggs, under, under the right circumstances, that gets you 15 years in prison and up to a $250,000 fine for the life of a bird, right? Since 1918, we've been protecting them. But, you know, since 1973, it's been legal in our country to kill babies in their mother's wombs. And isn't that baby in its mother's womb so much more valuable than the egg of a migratory bird in a nest somewhere? But... But you go find a, a whooping crane or a bald eagle's nest, go stomp on a few eggs, they will take all your money and put you in jail. The, the Bible says that you're worth way more. You're worth way more. Human life is special and precious to God, and we should protect it in every form. There's been a leak that this Roe versus Wade that was established in 1973 might be overturned. Christians, pray for this to happen. Pray to God that he would do it. What, what a miraculous thing that would take place in our country if that would be true. Because your life is valuable. Human life is valuable to God, and we should value it as well. But as I mentioned, this, this is not just human life that we're talking about. As valuable as human life is, much more than the birds, this is also the life of one of a, a follower of Jesus, right? If God is your master, according to verse 18 then this is true for you, that God is able to and willing to and eager to, I might add, provide for your life. God is able to provide for you, Christian. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then why do you worry? So y'all walked right into that one, didn't you? But God is able, God is able to take care of you. God is able to provide for you. God is able to protect you. And if you don't believe me when I say that, you can ask my friend Abraham and Sarah, who had a baby at the age of 90 and 100 years old because God said he was going to do it. And if you don't believe that, you can talk to my friend Noah and his family, who God rescued from a global flood. As a matter of fact, the only reason why we have birds to use as an example today is because God put them in an ark with Noah and his family and saved them from certain destruction. Let me tell you about my friend Joseph, who was sold into slavery and then put in a prison. So he was a, a slave in prison. Can you get much lower than that in the world? And God, it says, who was with him in that prison, delivered him from that prison and put him second in charge over the nation of Egypt. The lowest position to the highest position. God is able to deliver his people. And if you don't believe Joseph, you could talk to Moses and the Israelites who when they exited Egypt, they were staring at the Red Sea, a vast body of water that they could no, uh, no, have no chance of ever crossing on their own. And they had the Egyptian army hot on their heels ready to kill them. And so God parted the waters of the Red Sea to deliver them, his people, from danger. God is able to rescue you as well. And then maybe you, you should read about old David, King David, who as just a boy stared down a giant in full battle gear, and all David had was a, a, a few smooth rocks and a sling. And he did it because he believed that God would deliver him against this enemy that was against the people of God. Oh, and then let me tell you about Gideon. Gideon stared down a whole army that was so vast you couldn't even count them. They were so big. And he did it with only 300 soldiers alongside of him. And God delivered him as well. When you get to heaven, maybe you should ask Shadrach, Meshach, 
and Abednego who were thrown into a fiery furnace that, listen, was so hot that the people who threw them in the fiery furnace died. They burned to death because the furnace was so hot. And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fiery furnace alive, uninjured. And listen, they didn't even smell like smoke. And if you don't believe Rack, Shack, and Benny, let me tell you about their buddy named Daniel, who, because he prayed to God in faith, and refused to be told he couldn't pray to God, was thrown into a den of lions, hungry lions. He spent the night in the dark with a den of hungry lions. And the next morning, they said, Daniel, are you alive? And he said, oh yeah, God has protected me. And those were hungry lions, I know that because, you know, the people that conspired against him to get him thrown in the lion's den... They then were rounded up and thrown into the lion's den. The Bible says that they were dead before they hit the ground. The lions had devoured them. Should I go on? Because we could go on and on. You want me to tell you about Lazarus? You want me to tell you about Paul and Silas and Peter when they were in prison and miraculously uh, were freed from prison? Listen, the whole Bible is a story about all the many ways that God has provided for his people over and over and over again. And you know why we study it? Because we need to be reminded. Because we forget. We forget that God is able. And then when we forget, we get worried. So don't worry. If God is able, if God is interested in taking care of the birds and the grass and the flowers, you're worth so much more than those things, he can take care of you too. And if you don't believe me or Jesus when he says that, just read the rest of the Bible, story after story after story. So he says, first of all, think about the birds and the grass. Second reason why you shouldn't worry, according to Jesus here, is because, in verse 27 it says, it says this, it cannot add one moment to your lifespan. Isn't that true? The opposite is really true, right? It can take away moments from your lifespan. Worry causes stress, and stress causes heart conditions, right? And strokes, weight gain, all kinds of physical problems caused by stress, and stress is caused by worry. It can take away moments from your life. And depending on your translation, some translations, like I think King James and New King James, uh, there's a little bit of ambiguity here. I think this is the right way to say it. But some render it, it can't add a, a single cubit to your stature. So it can't make you any taller is, is, one, is one way of rendering that. I think the best way to say is it can't add anything to your life. But they're both true, right? If worry could make you taller, I would be in the NBA right, with some of y'all right now. But I'm not. I'm not. That's why this stage is so tall, because I'm so short, right? It won't make you any taller. It won't be too. But if it could, some of us would live at the top of a beanstalk. You know what I mean? We'd be giants. It won't make your life any longer. It'll make your life shorter. So it's not good for you. It won't add joy to your life. Worry will take joy from your life. It won't add happiness won't add satisfaction. Worry won't give you more sleep. It'll give you less sleep. It'll give you less happiness, less joy, less satisfaction. Give you less life. That's the point. It doesn't help you. It just hurts you. So why would you do it? The point is trust God rather than worry. And that's the third thing he says. The third reason he gives here, verse 32, he says, besides the Gentiles seek after those things, eagerly seek after or run after. Uh, and it's not really a racial designation here, the Jews versus the Gentiles. What, he, what Jesus is implying there is people who don't know God worry about these things. Lost people worry about some of the same things that we worry about. And we have a God in heaven to take care of us. If you have a God in heaven, then you don't have to worry. You don't have to panic. You get to pray rather than panic. So don't live like an atheist if you're a Christian. Don't have the mentality of an atheist 
if you're really a follower of Jesus. Don't worry like a lost person. If you have a father in heaven, a God in heaven that takes care of you, don't live like, act like, think like a spiritual orphan. If you have a godly parent in heaven to take care of you, your father God. You know that's true that kids worry about things? If you have a good parent as a child, you don't ever have to worry about all the things that adults have to worry about. Like, you know, the water bill. Like, kids don't know why the water comes out. They just know that it always does when you turn the faucet on. They don't have to think about what mom and dad think about, like working enough to pay the bill to keep the water on, dripping the faucet in the wintertime. They don't have to think about any of those things. Right? Like, like kids, if they have a good parent, a provider for them, they don't know how the food gets in the pantry or how the clothes get in the closet. They just think it magically appears. Every time I go to the pantry, there's food. The closet, there's always clothes. You don't have to think about that. And here's the thing. Children, children should never have to think about where their next meal's coming from. If they have clean water to drink or clothes to wear. Children should never have to worry about that. But if you have a good father in heaven, listen, you shouldn't have to worry about it either. So if you have a father in heaven that takes care of you, Why are you worried about these things? Why do you uh, stress about them? If you have a father, you should trust him. So let me give you an application here. And a question for you today is, the the things you worry about, let's scratch that, let's scratch that. The things that you are worried about, are you worrying about them like a Christian or like a lost person? Would a lost person who didn't have the God that you have, would they worry about that the same way you're worried about that? Like it all depended on you? Like it all depends on them? Like they've got no help? You ought to be concerned like a Christian, not worried like a lost person, like a person who doesn't know Jesus. And so if, if he left it right there, that would be good enough. Wouldn't it be? A command. Here's a command. Don't worry. When God tells you to do something, That's good enough, amen? If God says don't do it, don't do it. That's it. I'm good. I'm good right there. He doesn't leave it right there, though. He gives us an alternative to worry, an antidote to anxiety, if you will. Here's what he says in verse 33. He says, uh, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. He doesn't say don't worry, just don't worry. Go figure it out on your own. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to tell you how not to worry. Just don't do it. He doesn't say that. He says instead of worry. Here's an alternative to worry. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. Replace worry with something better. And I think the thing we should replace worry with is worship. Worship is literally putting God in his proper place. Putting him number one. You say, well, Pastor, I, I seek God. I'm here at church. I'm here at church seeking God. Okay, but he didn't just say seek God, does he? What does he say? Seek him first. Put him as your number one priority in your life. Be concerned with spiritual matters above physical matters. And all these things will be provided to you. Worship, then, is the cure for anxiety. Jesus says uh, through Peter in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Worship. Worship. And now, um, some of you might say, well, you don't have to go to church to worship, right? And you're right. You can worship in your, at your house. You can worship in your car, on, you know, listening to Christian radio or whatever. Some of you tell me you worship in your deer stand. I think you're just praying for a big buck. That's different, but, but whatever. But, but you can't read the Bible, honestly, and tell me there's not something special about corporate worship. You can't honestly read the Bible and say there's not something special about when God's people get together and worship. It's over and over and over throughout it. Worship. Worship. When you worry, worship. I I tell people this often. um, Whenever you feel worry, pray. And if you pray as much as you worry, you're going to be prayed up. If you're like me, right? You're going to be on top of your prayer life. Instead of worry, 
Worship and do it first. Put God first in your life. Put him first. Put him number one. Well, why should you put God first in your life? Friends, because he put you first, didn't he? He put you above his own desires. He put you above his only son, Jesus, when he sent him to a cross. God put you first, so put God first in your life. Seek him first. And I heard somebody say one time, I think it's true, what you seek, you will find. Think about that for a moment. Chew on that. What you seek, you will find. We're going to recognize our, our, our graduating seniors in a minute. And seniors, uh, as you graduate, everybody's telling you some of the same things, right? They're saying, you know, whatever your dreams are, go out there and chase them. The sky's the limit. You can do anything you set your mind to, right? And, and they're saying that to you for two reasons. They believe in you. And, number two, they believe in this same principle, that what you seek, you find. Do you believe that? If somebody puts their mind to something, they can accomplish really just about anything. So it's the same principle. What you seek, you will find. And if that's true, and that means that right now, you are as close to God as you want to be. Some of you say, well, pastor, I, wish I, I just wish I was closer to God right now. And I'll say to you, liar. If you wanted to be close to God, you would be close to God. What you seek, you will find. If you were seeking God, he's not going to hide from you. He will be found. You know this is true. Like if you have a friend that buys, uh, like say, a yellow Camry or something. You'll see a yellow Camry. I've never in my life seen a yellow Camry. That's crazy. But then what's going to start happening to you? Through the days and weeks and months, you're going to start noticing yellow Camrys all over the place. Suddenly, it's like yellow Camrys are everywhere. Why? Because you're looking for it. You ever notice that when you're already in a bad mood, a lot of other things happen to you that put you in a worse mood? How come? Because you're looking for trouble. If you are looking for an opportunity to help people, guess what? You'll see a lot of need out there in the world, right? You'll see a lot of opportunity to help and serve others because it's because you're looking for it. Same thing, if you want to find God, he will be found by you. If you want to be close to God, he's already there waiting for you to be close to him. What you seek, you will find. And if you still don't believe me, the next section, one paragraph down, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says, ask God and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. You are as close to God right now as you want to be. And if you're not very close to God, that means you don't want to be. So let's work on the want to be. Work on the want to be. And then you'll find that you are. Seek seek first the kingdom of heaven. Are you more worried about the kingdom of heaven? Or do you really worry more about your own kingdom? Oh, see, if you you got your own kingdom above the kingdom of heaven, you put the kingdom of heaven first, you won't be worried about those things anymore. Seek the Lord while he may be found. You can only seek the Lord for a a certain amount of time. If you die and land at the pearly gates to be judged, that will be be the end of seeking the Lord. You won't have an opportunity to seek the Lord anymore. So if you're alive today, seek the Lord. And all these things will be provided for you. And he he closes with this thought. Don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. That's true. Maybe not a real positive thought, but it's true. So if you're going to worry, if you have to worry, if you can't help but worry, here's a strategy I think Jesus gives us. Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about the things that affect today. Focus on the things that affect today. I know a lot of times people worry about things that happened yesterday or in the past that are already over and done with. We're still worried about them. You worry about tomorrow, things that probably won't even happen, that may not even come to pass. Don't worry about that. Worry about today. Get through today. Do everything God wants you to do today. Handle today in your life. Corey Timboom says this way, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Worry about today. So um, there was a lot of 
presuppositions here this morning. And the biggest one was this. I, I was presupposing, and the, and the text does, that these things are applicable to you only if, according to verse, eight, uh, verse 18, that God is your master, that God is your father in heaven. So well, isn't God everybody's master? Isn't God everybody's father in heaven? No, he's not. He's not. God's in charge of everything. He's sovereign over everything, absolutely. But he's not everyone's master. He's not everyone's father in heaven. You have to place him in that position in your life. You'll submit to him one day, oh, certainly. But it's better to do it now than in eternity in a place called hell. If you want something to worry about today, I'll give you a good thing to worry about. I'll give you something you ought to worry about today. And that is whether or not you're going to spend eternity in a place called heaven or eternity in a place called hell. Hell is a great thing to worry about if you don't have a father in heaven, if God's not your master. When you come to Jesus and you become a child of God, you no longer have to worry about eternity. No longer have to worry about hell. Here's a great thing for a Christian. We come to Jesus and we trust him with our eternity. We trust him with our soul, with with our sin problem. We trust him with everything. So that's why if we could trust him with those big things, we don't have to worry about the little things that are mentioned here. But the question is, have have you trusted him with the big things first? Have you become a child of God? Have you been saved, given your heart and your life to his care and control? If you're worried about eternity right now, let's think about it for a moment. Let's think about it for a moment. Has there been a time in your life when you asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and forgive your sins and you made him the master of your life? Not just a boss in your life, the master. Have you had a moment that you can identify in the history of your lifespan where you from the bottom of your heart did that, made Jesus your Lord and Savior once and for all? Has there been a moment? Okay, if you you can come up with a moment, then let me ask you, was it it sincere? Was it from the bottom of your heart? Did you have other motivation? You know, hey, my friends were going down front. We were at camp. I got fired up. Is there something else going on? Or was it sincere from the bottom of your heart? And then let me ask you this question. From that moment to this moment, has there been some change in your life as a product of that decision you made to follow Jesus? If you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he comes into your heart and does a work, don't you think there'll be some evidence of that transformation in your life today? Well, of course. It's just logical. So if not, there's no evidence. If your motivation wasn't pure, if you don't even have that moment anyways to think about, then here's what's true. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. You're not saved. You're not right with God right now. You're not. But listen, you can be. That's the good news. Jesus died on a cross so that you could be right with God forever. Only thing he's waiting on is for you to surrender your life, make him the master, put him in charge. Ask him to come in and forgive your sins, and he'll do it. He'll take him away. 